So, um, you know, I've worked on the city council, but I've also worked in campaigns. So there aren't any huge surprises, um, but the, um, the act of being a candidate instead of being a support person um, is, is new and it's a big transition for me. Um, my work with um, Councilmember Lakata has been, like I said, as a support person, it's been about promoting the, the, the person in that role. Um, my work bef before working for Nick is also as a support person, as a community organizer, as a community, you're not the person at the, at the lead, you're developing leadership in others. So um, the transition of being the person in front um, has been has been interesting um, and challenging, um, particularly when it comes to doing things like what I'm doing right now, talking to the members of the press. Um, and you know, I'm not talking about what somebody else's position is. I'm talking about what my position is, and it's a it's a very different thing. Also, uh, public speaking has been a challenge as well. Um, but I'm learning as I go, and that's part of why I'm doing this. I have a certain set of skills that um, have been developed over the last 25 years in my professional time working, and um, I want to be a better version of me and start working on some of the skills that um, I think are, are dormant in me um, and potential for, for leadership on behalf of this district. So in your most recent round of uh, doorbelling and or mingling with people at, mm -hmm. uh, at events, um, what have people been asking you about or telling you about? Sure. Um, I just finished my 110th hour of doorbelling yesterday. I actually went back and counted the number of hours I've done going back to March. And, um, you know, it's... I actually, it's the most pleasurable part of the campaign for me is going out and talking to people one on one. I really enjoy it. I've done it as a community organizer, and it sort of feels like I'm getting back to sort of what my foundational roots are as um, how to approach governance. Um, and as far as the, the issue, to almost to a person, it's issues related to development. Uh, people understand that um, growth is inevitable. They understand the uh, idea of developing dense, walkable communities, but they feel that the city hasn't done a good job of managing that growth, um, particularly as it relates to um, transportation impacts and um, affordability. So that's really um, what I hear day in, day out from folks. Any specific things that people have asked you to do or ask, or if you could do if you were elected? Specific things. Um, I think people feel in general, um, if I could sort of take what I hear as a generality and boil it down to a specific thing, um, I think people are tired of the city coming to them with uh, projects that are perceived as um, done deals and asking for their comment sort of after the fact, as opposed to identifying what the goals and, our, and objectives are for um, uh, city construction projects or city um, transportation projects and developing those um, from the ground up. The best example I have um, since being on the campaign trails, I was at, I think, I think you guys, I think you were at that meeting. The first um, meeting about the, uh, Admiral Transportation Plan, mm -hmm. and, you know, it was quite amazing to, not just the fact that uh, when they did the parking counts was in the middle of the winter, um, but I, what I felt was very poignant and a really great example of um, how the city needs to talk to the community first um, in the design of these programs is the fact that they, the, the side of the road that they want to remove the parking is the one side of the road that everybody parks on. Regardless of what side of the street you live on, people park on the side of the road where the cars don't get hit. So people who live on the opposite side will cross the street to park their car. And um, that was the side of the road that they're proposing to remove the parking from. So I just think that's a really perfect example of how if, um, the process was reversed, um, the city went out and identified what the objective was and engaged the community on identifying ways to solve it. You wouldn't have signs all over town opposing this project. 
Now, certainly, you know, you're not with SDOT, so you can't be blamed for that. But I know that one criticism or question that some have brought up to you mm -hmm. is the fact that, well, you've been part of the system for X years. What are you going to do differently if you're elected that you couldn't have been doing during those years? Sure. Um, so, I mean, I think for folks that have followed the um, work I've done on the council, um, the work I've done on behalf of Councilmember Lakata, I don't think um, most people could say that I'm a status quo politician. The, the issues I've worked on are not sort of status quo issues. We've always um, been a strong voice to hold developers more accountable, um, always willing to put out um, proposals that were bold um, and challenged the status quo. So I, you know, I'm, I'm going to continue that um, tradition because it is part of sort of my, my foundational approach to how I want to prioritize my time and spend my energy working on issues that affect people's day-to-day -day lives. So, um, you know, I've, I've been part of the system, but I don't think I've been part of the status quo. And I think some people have referred to me as the um, the outsider's insider. I mean, my, it's the way I approach my work is about giving people information about what's going on in the inside so that they can be better advocates for their issues. Um, I think that helps everybody. I help. I think that helps um, folks who are inside who are governing, and I, I think that results in um, better representation. So on a specific um, issue, so we just happened, this just happened to be happening while the, uh, the, the whole mayor's Housing plan mm -hmm. um, came out yesterday. Yeah. Council member um, Lakata, I know, has a kind of a, a counter plan. But but you specifically, what what that's been put out there so far by anybody or yourself, mm -hmm. do you favor or support to address this problem? Well, two things that I'm very pleased. Um, you know, since I've been campaigning, there are two items that I've been calling for that I see are reflected in the um, in the HAL recommendations. One is the restoration of the very popular community service officer program of the SPD that is called out um, as one of the recommendations. Um, it relates to um, a lot of different types of civil public safety issues, but the reason why it's in the HAL report is because the um, community service officers, before they were disbanded, um, were used to mediate some civil disputes between landlords and tenants, um, things like lockouts. Uh, that are illegal or utility shutoffs that are illegal, the CSO officers would go and speak to the landlords and basically say, um, you know, this is not lawful and the city could take an action against you if you don't correct this. Um, so it, it, and the CSO program is, is great for things other than uh, resolving tenant landlord disputes as well. Um, it just makes police officers t time that they need to spend doing both responding to um, public safety issues and also being proactive, um, it makes their time more efficient. So I'm really pleased to see that's in there. The other thing that directly relates to housing is I'm very, very pleased to see that the affordability requirements attached to um, both the uh, leakage fee program and the new proposed um, uh, mandatory inclusionary zoning program are both pegged at 60%. Um, the council direction last year in our existing incentive zoning program has the affordability levels pegged at 80%, and that's really not where the where the need is, is greatest. Um, the studies show that there is um, sufficient housing, uh, sufficient rental housing available at 80% at the market. Um, it's really the, the under 60 that is where the great, where the largest deficit of units is. So I'm very, very pleased. Developers have always said, well, we can't do that. We can't make that pencil out. And so the fact that they've um, reached an agreement on that is, is really fantastic. Um, some of the things that I would have liked to see in there that aren't in there is um, in the discussion of up zones. Um, there hasn't been a discussion of the displacement impacts of redevelopment. And, you know, we, we see it right here um, in, in West Seattle. Every time they build a new building, it, many times it's after tearing down a smaller um, sort of net, what they call naturally affordable rental um, that's, you know, just older and, and um, more affordable just because of the age. So there, I think there needs to be a discussion about what, what the potential impacts are because if we're 
we're building 20,000 new units of affordable housing, but we're tearing down 40,000 units. There are, um, the city says that it, there are 40,000 structures that are between um, single family and fourplex that are homes to renters in the city. So we really need to um, look at what we're doing and look at whether or not those up zones are really um, serving our goals to add affordable housing. Um, so that's something I'm, I'm disappointed wasn't included. And then um, I think in general, I uh, question, I mean, I understand that they're calling it a grand bargain for a reason. It's a bargain because the um, development community gets something out of it. it gets this, these, these proposals for all these up zones. Um, but from the city's perspective and a policymaking perspective, I have to ask, um, are these up zones making it more likely that we are able to meet these housing goals? Um, or are they serving some other purpose? Because um, we know through the city's um, housing capacity report that we have the significant capacity for three times our, um, our anticipated growth uh, for the next 20 years. So the anticipated growth is the need for 70,000 units. We have capacity um, for, I think it's like 230,000 units. So if we have the existing capacity for, for growth that we need, why do we need these up zones? Is it just to increase the flexibility for developers? And if increasing the flexibility for developers we are um, making it more likely that development doesn't happen specifically in the areas where we want it to happen, um, right? Create flexibility. You know, maybe there will be less development in areas like, uh, you know, Westwood Village or Highland Park, where I live, where we're not even close to meeting um, our um, our growth goals in the existing 2010 comp plan. So that concerns me. Um, you know, the fact that the uh, West Seattle Junction uh, Urban Village is at, if you count, um, if you include permitted but not built units, it's almost at 300% of its growth goals for a 10-year period. We've got 10 more years to go. Um, every one of the, um, uh, the sort of the targeted areas in West Seattle, with the exception, again, of um, Westwood Village and Highland Park um, are above where they're intended to be. Um, so the question of what, whether or not this is just a bargain or whether or not the up zones um, serve some policy objective for the city is a question I have. And then finally, um, you know, this the mayor has um, this model that he uses for handling difficult issues, and it's been effective putting together these these task force, and um, you know meeting out of the public lo public eye, um, and coming up with these recommendations, and that worked very well for um, uh, the fifteen dollar minimum wage because that was a single law that was going to be passed afterwards, and they, you know the mayor sort of had this agreement with the council at the time that that the council would agree to sort of keep the spirit of that agreement intact through the legislative process. And there were some key people on the council that kept reminding us um, of the need to not, you know, throw a monkey wrench into everything by bringing up a whole new set of ideas through the legislative process. But this is, um, you know, what is it, 60 recommendations? Um, and, you know, not all of them are city laws. Um, some of them are state laws. I don't think we can say that um, this bargain is necessarily going to hold through the multiple legislative processes that are going to be necessary to implement it. So um, I think um, we need to go into sort of the next steps, um, understanding that and realizing that, that that's okay. There's, there, that's, we're not going to, we're not going to spoil the soup. Um, by engaging in, um, you know, our legislative process for deciding on how to um, implement recommended recommendations made by the executive. One thing uh, we're asking all candidates, and speaking of certain complex issues, is we're talking about the transportation levy. Yeah. Are you personally going to vote for it? I am going to vote for it. I um, was a strong proponent for um, diversifying 
the uh, funding mechanisms, the revenue sources for um, the levy. Uh, I felt that it was important to get it passed to be able to promote it as a renewal um, combined with the employee head tax, Im uh, impact fees, and commercial parking tax, and that I was uh, a, a person who believed that by going out to the voters with that message and marketing it that way, that um, it would be more likely to pass. But um, that said, you know, I'm not going to let the um, perfect be the enemy of the good, and you know, I'm I'm going to vote for it myself personally because I can afford it. But I also recognize that a lot of folks out there um, feel that. You know, it's another thing that, that comes up when I'm talking to people on the doors, that our reliance on property tax levies um, is problematic. You know, you can take that as an opportunity to talk to people about our, um, you know, our uh, regressive tax structure and the limits placed on local government because of the IMAN initiative where we're limited on increasing um, the city's property tax uh, levy every year, but the fact of the matter is is that, um, you know, people feel, feel the stress of the increased levies and, um, you know, I think it's really incumbent on us to be able to make the argument that um, we're making everybody pay, pay their fair share. Well, separate from the financing of it, though, yes. so what do you tell people who may, you know, the common refrain, at least that we hear, we see in comments and mm -hmm. so forth, is there's not much in it for West Seattle. Um, how, how do you counter that, though? Is, is there more than you think that people are seeing? Well, I think if you break it down into its parts for um, all of the neighborhoods or all of the districts, if you want to use the, the district frame, um, I think anybody could say that. I mean, I, I think its um, its strength is it, the um, is when you take it in, in whole. Um, I think if you look at any single district, anybody could say, oh, there should be more in it. Um, the thing I think, I mean, there are um, projects I know that have been really important to West Seattle for a long time that are finally funded. Um, and I know there are, there are, there are things I wish um, had been included as well. Um, I wish there had been um, some specifics instead of this, instead of there being a, um, an assessment citywide of the number of um, new sidewalks that were going to be built. I wish they had broken that down uh, per district. So we would have, I mean, I think that would have been a positive thing to be able to tell folks who um, feel that it's long past time for there to be sidewalks in their neighborhoods. Um, there are some uh, pedestrian safety um, uh, uh, commitments that I think could be, could be, could have been strengthened. But, um, you know, and I didn't, then you you know you talk to people who who understood that the bridging the gap levy was going to fix everything, and I think people don't understand that our reliance on levies is until something changes um, is an ongoing thing. So we don't ever get to the end because there are always more needs that we don't have um, a sustainable uh, set of revenue source to to pay for. So um, you know it's. It's, it's tough, but I, I do think that there um, are some, some good projects in the move levy for, um, for West Seattle. But I also think that some of those projects are also controversial, and we have to be careful on how we move forward on them because they, could, um, they also could uh, um, spoil the broth. Um, I know there's a lot of controversy about um, what exactly are we going to be doing at, um, on 35th Southwest. You know, I think we need to start with the um, statement that we're going to reduce speeds there um, and have a phased approach and see what, what else needs to happen after that. I don't think we, we should start with the, um, the um, assumption that we're going to be um, reducing travel lanes and um, adding bike lanes and, you know, making physical changes to the street. Well, we'll find out soon enough because that's uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Um, w regarding and the levy certainly isn't the only way that SDOT could possibly you know do anything to help people getting out of here. What what um, what are you thinking about in terms of furthering the goal of somehow making it easier to get to and from West Seattle and South Park for that matter? Um, well, I one of the projects that they talk about over in my neighborhood that sounds um, sounds like one of those things that. 
it would have been great if uh, we'd thought of it sooner. But, um, you know, I'm on the top of um, Highland Park, the top of the hill there, and that intersection, uh, Highland Park and um, Holden, <coughs> is a major way that people use to, to get out of West Seattle. Um, and I think SDOT has just realized it recently that that is um, a big um, way to get off the peninsula and um, has been talking about um, putting the city's first um, arterial um, traffic circle in there because in the mornings um, there are, there's a traffic jam four blocks down Holden and then there's spill off into the neighborhood streets and get into the queue <laughs> to get down the hill. So um, that's very much in early planning, and it's you know it's an example of a project that's not in the move levy, but would be um, I, I think it should be a high priority um, because of the multiple interests that it serves. Do you think there's anything more we can do with the bridge or the bottleneck exits mm -hmm. uh, from the bridge? Um, so I know that there's there's some interest in um, looking at um, additional bus only lanes. Um, I know that one of the things that um, we've asked for is for a new um, uh, egress plan uh, for um, the city. Um, I think that we really need to. Um, I don't know. I don't have the answers to the questions of. of of what the solutions are, but I think the city needs to put a finer, uh, a finer focus on the importance of identifying those solutions and um, pulling together folks to um, to study the problems. One of uh, my favorite questions to ask people in this uh, so far is, how did you wind up in West Seattle? How did I end up in West Seattle? So. Um, I was living um, up on Beacon Hill at the time, and um, I was living in an intentional community that um, I started with a bunch of folks, um, and uh, we were a 100% um, income sharing community. Um, it's called, it was called the Beacon Hill House. It's still there. They've renamed themselves, but they were called the Beacon Hill House at the time, and um, I did 100% income sharing for two years, and um, I'd had enough. <laughs> I mean, you're basically putting your your paycheck in a pot with, um, you know, ten other people, and paying for your collective uh, needs out of that. Um, you, we had timesheets for um, our work and um, our inside and outside work. George Holland wrote a a piece a few years back on this particular um, community. And nobody had to work more than 40 hours a week, regardless of whether or not they were working inside or outside of the community. So I didn't have to go to the grocery store for two years because that was considered work that was valued by the community. Um, and because I was always working much more than 40 hours a week, um, I sort of had a credit for doing some of the other things that were needed. Um, but I had enough. <laughs> it was a fun experiment. Um, uh, it also was, was a great um, resource to me with uh, being a single mom. Uh, I got a lot of, the, the community members got credit for helping me care for my daughter. Um, so my working long hours, there was always somebody home um, who got value for um, being home with my daughter. I was 12 at the time. So I, um, I was ready for a change, but I wasn't looking for to buy a house at that point. Um, I'm actually in um, a house that some very close friends of mine um, were moving out of, and they were um, they were starting a family, and the house was too small for them, and they moved over to um, another fo another place over off of Myers Way, and they were selling the house that I that I bought for them from them. So it was just a, a matter of um, uh, timing and opportunity. They were um, motivated sellers, and I was a motivated buyer. And I bought that little 700 square foot house. <laughs> and that's where you still are. Yep. To this day. Yep. Yeah. Um, the Myers Way reminds me of something that I wanted to ask mm. about. Um, 
one of the things that I saw kind of buried in the uh, reports and the action plan mm-hmm. yesterday involved um, selling city surplus property. Mm-hmm. And it made me think of the uh, local advocates who have been, you know, concerned about, like, old substations yeah. and little parcels that they're all going to turn into townhouses. Mm-hmm. Um, and the city has this rule about, well, you can't just transfer from one department to the other. Right. This department has to pay that one. Right. Um, have you been, been talking with people about this issue at all? Any thoughts about I how that's all going to happen? I actually have been talking to folks about about this issue, um, and I think um, the city, I've looked at it as well because um, we have oversight over um, the city's FAS department, which manages the disposition of all these properties regardless of um, what departments they um, they live in, which, which departments own the properties. And um, one of the things that we've discovered is that the disposition process begins when a department takes a look at a piece of property and uses sort of the lens of, does this property meet um, needs that are part of our mission? And if the answer is no, then the disposition process begins. And so I believe that there needs to be sort of a lens put on that review that goes beyond just the needs of an individual department. So it's not just whether or not, you know, a city light substation needs that particular property to fulfill its utility mission. It's there should be a lens put on that that property and all the properties in the city to determine whether or not um, the property meets a, a broader citywide need, whether or not it's for, for housing or for, for open space. Those questions need to be asked before the disposition begins. And as it relates to open space, I think it's a really great opportunity um, to identify in advance um, of the needs. Um, I think our um, open space needs in West Seattle um, are pretty well met. If you look at the um, open space gap report that the city um, produces, um, not so much so in South Park, but um, they're they're pretty pretty well met. But again, I think we need to be looking forward at what um, our growth projections are and where that growth is going to go and look for those opportunities in advance of that occurring so we're not in a reactive position. And so if we identify properties that can be used for open space before development occurs, we can sort of bank them. So um, I'm curious um, if there is any particular issue or issues that you think should be getting talked about in this campaign, in this process, more than they are being, something that just never comes up that you just wishing for a chance to talk about um i don't know that it never comes up it's it i think it's um coming up more but in i'm somebody who has always felt that and it's a topic i already mentioned so i'm going to opportunity to mention again but um i don't feel that we talk enough about the um displacement impacts of our land use policy um the, you know, the, again, the fact that um, there are 40,000 40, renter households, well, no, there are 40,000 structures that are homes to, to rental households, so it could be more, depending on the size of the structure, um, that are be, between single family and four unit dwellings. And we don't, um, you know, we, we have a race and social justice equity analysis in much of what we do but um, it doesn't seem to extend much to our land use policy. Um, We have, for the first time this year, um, based on the the request of some some council members, asked for um, a displacement vulnerability index to be included as part of the comp plan review. And so they've done that, um, and they've identified the areas that are um, most likely to uh, experience displacement as a result of the comp plan review um, and comp plan changes. Um, So that's good. It's good to have the information, but now we have to identify what the strategies are to address it. Um, People, you know, talk about gentrification and economic development a lot and always have, but we've never really identified um, a point at which we agree, according to policy, that economic economic development becomes gentrification or displacement, and um, what what we do at that point. 
um, when one becomes the other to course correct. That reminds me actually of an issue that, um, that we've seen you involved with um, in your role as, uh, as council assistant um, at uh, community meetings, mm -hmm. which is the, um, the, the dealing with um, homelessness um, and now there's uh, you know, the new plan to at least add a few encampments mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, has, that, has that come up at all? Um, how do you feel about the current plan? Um, so, I, you know, I think the time that uh, Nicholsville was in Highland Park was uh, um, a challenging time for everybody involved. Um, I, my role uh, during that time was, uh, was again, to um, share information with the community um, about what the decision making was and what the opportunities were to influence that decision making. And um, I think that, um, I think the role I played um, was appreciated appreciated uh, by folks in, in Highland Park. Um, and I think moving forward, the, the approach is, uh, again, it's, I think it's about um, sharing responsibility for this, um, this challenge to our, to our city. And um, I think the idea of um, identifying some sites um, that are new sites that where um, encampments haven't been before um, is, a, is uh, something that is grounded in principles of equity and fairness. Um, you know, encampments are not a solution to the homelessness problem, but they are a solution to the immediate uh, life and safety threats faced by people who have to sleep out on the streets, and I'm glad that the city um, is is recognizing that. It's you know, from my perspective, um, the fact that we have so many people who have to sleep outside is actually a, a public safety issue. Um, it's you know, if we had um, a, a natural disaster, and um, you know, a large section of our population. Was, was homeless, we wouldn't say, we'll deal with that once we fix your houses, which is what we're, what we're saying with uh, focusing all of our efforts on permanent housing. We're saying, we're not going to deal with this problem until we get you permanent housing. And we wouldn't do that. We would figure out any way possible to shelter people. So, um, you know, I'm pleased to see that the, um, that the city is, is recognizing that th this is a public safety issue for folks. It looks like, though, the uh, the same site that Nicholsville was on is in kind of the second possible yeah. tier. So do you think that it's okay if it winds up there again in a year, maybe, or two years? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, I think it's okay to be on the list of potential sites. Yeah, I do. Okay, um, I was going to ask my last question. And that's so where we're at. For okay, so, so um, our, our closing question is, um, so somebody walks up to you and they look you straight in the eye and they say, well, I'm going to vote for... And they named somebody else, mm -hmm. the other eight candidates. Yeah. And what do you tell them is the reason why really they want to vote for you instead? I haven't done that yet. <laughs> I've been trying to talk somebody out of um, their vote. I usually just thank them for letting me know. But um, you know, if I if I were to do that, um, I would talk about my experience. I would say that I know that that experience can be considered by some to be a bit of a double-edged sword, um, but that my focus and my experience is really about trying to find uh, ways to make government work better for our district. I want to use what I've learned to represent District 1 in a way that's, that's more responsive, and that um, you know, my experience has been really focused on helping people on the outside uh, influence the decisions that are being made on the inside.